just like to welcome everyone to this uh, third event in our series, The Haskane Hour. My name is Lauren Falkenberg, and I am the Associate Dean Research at the Haskane School of Business. And Jim DeWald, our Dean, gives his regrets for not being able to be here this morning. So the format of the Haskane Hour, which we just started this year, is to have a researcher talk about what the research has to say about a, an important issue to the Calgary business community, and then have a seasoned business professional give the uh, comments about how this is relevant to the workplace. What, when we started this series, I worked with our communications people and I said, we have a Haskane promise. Not only is this the Haskane hour, we have a Haskane promise. And that promise is that you will receive nutrition for the body and food for thought all in under an hour. So we are working very hard at keeping this to the hour. So today's topic is on power, risk, and decision making. And these are all factors that influence us every day in our professional lives and in our personal lives. And the combination of these three factors can lead to either good decisions or bad decisions. And that's what we're here to talk about today. And I am willing to go out on a limb and bet that every one of us in this room today will be influenced by these three factors, either in a decision we have to make or a decision that's made around us. And so that's the importance in the, uh, of this topic. So what I'd like to do, the structure of our Haskane Hour is to have a researcher speak about the topic and what the research has to say, and then have a seasoned professional, a distinguished speaker, come up and reflect on those comments. So I will start by introducing our speakers. They will give their comments, and then we will open the floor to questions. Our first speaker is Mehdi Morali. Mehdi got his PhD in marketing in consumer behavior and then six years ago came to the Haskane School and has developed expertise in decision making and in marketing. Our other speaker is Helen Wesley. Helen is a Haskane grad and she received the Max Award as a very distinguished alumni. She also has her uh, MBA in international business and CFA and has worked across the globe in the oil and gas industry. So we'll start by asking Helen and Mehdi to come up and Mehdi will start. Thanks, okay. Thanks Lauren and uh, thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, how's the mic by the way, can everybody hear me? All right, thank you. So let's, let me start by um, showing you this famous quote by uh, Benjamin Franklin. In it, Franklin seems to suggest that the only certainties in life are death and taxes. Well, I don't know about you, but I like to believe that life offers a few more certainties than life than death and taxes. Maybe not many, but a few more. At least for me, one that can easily or safely be added to the list is that life is a series of decisions. We make decisions every day. Big decisions, small decisions. We make decisions in domains from the personal, the financial, the professional, even the gastronomic. And we make, in fact, so many decisions every day that we're often making decisions when we don't know that we are making decisions. We're not even aware of it. Uh, uh, a second certainty that can also be safely added to the list is that some people have more power than others. Most societies, most organizations, most groups that we belong to are organized in a hierarchical fashion with some people having more power than others. In a typical business organization, in a company, for example, the CEO would have more power than, say, a department manager who would have more power than an employee that reports to her. Right? Perhaps even more importantly, all of us regularly experience feelings of either being powerful or powerless, regardless of where we stand in the formal social hierarchy. Uh, for example, if we're asked for our expert opinion, that could induce a psychological state of feeling powerful. If we are being judged, if we are being evaluated by our peers, that induces a state of feeling powerless. So the ubiquity of both 
power and decisions in everyday life prompts a critical question. Do we decide differently when we feel powerful versus powerless? Right. And more specifically, what I want to focus on is, does power influence, does the experience of power influence how much risk are we willing to take? Right. Well, the short answer of that is yes. Power does influence how much risk we take. Power influences how we decide and what we decide on. Uh, but that's probably not the most interesting answer. Right? Um, in, in, cer in certain very specific cases, power could promote more conservative decision making. But more generally, research shows that power actually tends to increase risk taking. Right? That's not surprising and may not be very interesting. But what is interesting is the question, why? Right? This is a very important question. Why does power increase risk taking? And the reason why this is an important question is if we understand the reasons, because there isn't only one, uh, then we can design and develop uh, effective strategies for limiting any unwanted effects of power on our decision making. Yeah. So as I said, there are more than one reasons. And the first one is that power increases risk taking because power tends to increase optimism in the perception of risk. When we feel powerful, we tend to overestimate the chances of success. We tend to underestimate the chances of failure. Power increases risk also because it reduces our aversion to losses. Right? So any given loss seems less bad when we feel powerful than when we don't. And then power, powerful people sometimes make risky decisions to let you know that they are powerful to signal their power. Right. So I'm going to look at these three reasons or mechanisms, if you want, that describe the effect of power on, on risk taking. And to illustrate the first one, um, I'm going to ask a couple of very simple questions. Okay. What are the chances that your home will be broken into in the next six months? What are the odds that the investment opportunity that you're considering right now is going to Lead, yield the desired return? Well, it turns out that the answer to these simple questions is very sensitive to how powerful we feel. When we feel powerful, we tend to overestimate the chances that our investment is going to be successful, and we tend to underestimate the, uh, the chances or the odds that somebody will bro break into our house. So what that has, it, it has actually implications for what we do, for the actions we do. So it could influence what kind of insurance coverage we might select. It could influence the kind of security system that we might invest in. It would influence whether the stock that we're looking at is something that we're going to invest in or not. Right. Uh, when the stakes are high, and mis un uh, misestimation, an underestimation of the negative outcome of, or, or failure uh, could actually lead to disastrous consequences. Um, as we've seen, as you see here, uh, one of the most powerful economists of the time and the president of the United States, arguably a powerful person as well, both of them grossly underestimated the likelihood of the worst financial crisis in history. Uh, uh, another good example of how power could uh, distort our perception of risk is the famous failed acquisition of Snapple by Quaker Oats. Now, William Smithberg was a very powerful chairman and CEO of Quaker Oats. He had previously bought Gatorade and made a very successful acquisition with, with Gatorade. So riding on that success, he decided to buy Snapple and position uh, Quaker Oats as a market leader in, in, uh, in soft drinks. Now, he overestimated Quaker Oats' capacity to turn Snapple into an international brand. He paid $1.7 billion to acquire Snapple, which was valued at the time at $7 million, $700 million on Wall Street. So he overpaid $1 billion. After 27 months, Quaker Oats sold Snapple for $300 million. So to put that in perspective, Every day that Quaker Oats owned Snapple, 
it cost them $2 million. So that's, that's a, a significant loss. Right? Um, now, in many cases, optimism or undue optimism explains why power could, could, could increase risk taken, but it's not the only reason. Uh, sometimes the powerful make risky decisions not because they overestimate the chances of success or underestimate the chances of failure, but because they actually don't, they're not concerned about the consequences of a failure, right? So Vladimir Putin apparently is not very concerned with how the world might respond to his involvement in, or to Russia's involvement in uh, Ukraine, right? Um, <coughs> perhaps to better explain this uh, reduced loss aversion and distinguish it from the increased optimism, let's look at a, a simpler question. Uh, on the table, on the cards that, that, that you had at, uh, on your table, you were asked a couple of questions. And the first one asked you if you would accept to play this gamble that you know, a flip of a coin would either earn you $150 if it's heads or would cost you $100 if it's tails. Uh, how many of you would accept to play this gamble? Let's see a show of hands. That's pretty good. You must all be feeling powerful this morning. <laughs> well, it turns out that in situations like this, most people actually reject the gamble. Even though that gamble has a positive expected value, but most people will not accept it because of something called loss aversion. Loss aversion means that a loss of $100 is much more painful to us than a gain of $150 would be pleasurable to us. Right? Uh, and this question or a similar type of question has been asked to thousands of people, and this is the typical percentages of people that actually would accept the gamble, right? We're looking at less than a quarter, less than, that's 22% on average, right? But what happens when people feel powerful, like all of you this morning? Well, that percentage almost doubles, right? So we're still under the 50%. Still the majority of people rejects it. But now people become twice as likely to accept this gamble when they feel powerful. Now, why is that increase in risk taking? It isn't due to perceptions. It's not because people think that they have more than 50% chance to, gain, to win or lose. In fact, when we ask people, you know, what is the probability of winning $100 and what is the probability of losing $100, everybody correctly estimated those probabilities at 50-50. You know, when you think about it, a coin flip, and then you're asking people, what is the probability of landing a head or a tail? To me, that's like a one item IQ test. And thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, most people are smart enough to get it, right? But um, when we asked people about how they valued the benefits and the cost of those outcomes, right? So how, how pleased would you be with gaining $100, how pained would you be with losing $100? Here we found a difference. And the difference is in the perceived or the expected pain of losing $100, right? So what power did is it lessened that expected pain of losing $100. So $100 is $100. But when you feel powerful, somehow losing $100 is not as painful as when you don't feel powerful, right? Now, President Bush, may have underestimated the dawn of the financial crisis. President Putin may not care very much about how the world will respond to Russia's involvement in um, Ukraine. But when Kim Jong-un last year had his uncle, his powerful uncle, executed, his decision was as much about consolidating his power as about sending a message to the rest of the world. Look at me. I am powerful, I am dangerous, right? So this example illustrates the third way in which power could influence risk taking. When people have power, they like it, right? Power is a good thing. People like having power, like feeling powerful, and maybe more than anything, they like to let others know that they have power. 
right? So despite Margaret Thatcher's wise advice, most people, when they have power, they want you to know that they have power. So, and that could lead to increasing uh, risk taking because one way to show that you have power is to show that you're not afraid to take risk. So we've explored this uh, phenomenon for the past few years with many of my talented colleagues uh, across Canada and the US. And we found, we collected quite a bit of evidence that supports this power signaling. So I'm gonna just show you one study just so that I show you something from what we do. Um, on the card, you had another question that asked you, what would you do uh, if the company that you're suing offered you a settlement for 90% of the claim that you're making? Well, we asked this question to a number of students and some of them we empowered, others we didn't. And what happened is for a group of students, we told them that your discussion, your decision will be discussed as a group. And for others, we told them that your decision is totally private. You do it. We don't even want to know about it. You just make that decision. It's for you. It's training, right? Uh, and we wanted to know if there was a difference. Because we reasoned that if risk taken reflects signaling of power, then the effect of power on risk taken should be greater when the decision is public than when it is private, right? So it makes sense. You're not going to signal if there's no audience to signal to. Right? So the, the, the tendency of taking more risk because you're powerful should be less if the decision is private. And that's exactly what we found. So when you look at it, in the public condition, there was a big difference between people who were feeling powerful versus the rest, There's either a control group or people that were made to feel powerless. Right? And in the private condition, when people thought that you know, they didn't have to discuss their decision with anybody else, uh, then that effective power was much less. Right? Now we've also con conducted a lot of other studies on this and uh, some, some of the evidence that we collected that supports the signaling is that uh, you know, when people have less of a need to signal, so for example uh, when the powerful are given an opportunity to assert their power before that decision task or when they've had enough time with power that uh, they now feel confident that others recognize their power and accept it uh, then they tend to take less risk. Right. So just to summarize, we've seen that power increases risk taken in general. And perhaps more importantly, we talked about why that happens and we identified three different mechanisms. So power increases risk taken because power increases optimism in the perception of risk. It increases risk taken because it reduces our aversion to losses and powerful people sometimes take risk to communicate their power to others. Now, these three processes often operate below the level of conscious awareness. That is, we're not, we may know that power influences our decision or we may not, but we rarely know why. We don't say, oh, well, I'm making this decision just so that I can show off. Or I'm making this decision just so that, because I'm actually, misestimating the chances of success and failure. Uh, so if I have one thing, one takeaway from this talk is that if you find yourself feeling powerful and are about to make a risky decision, please step back and ask yourself a few questions. Ask yourself, am I being overly optimistic in my assessment of the chances of success and failure? Am I have I considered all the information that is available for me? Or am I just focusing on the positive information? Uh, um, have I valued all the possible benefits and costs associated with the outcomes objectively? And am I only doing, am I only choosing the risky option to signal my power to others? Would I choose differently if I didn't have to show them who the boss is? Right? Now, the goal here is not to promote conservative decision making at all times. In fact, I'd be the first one to say that a healthy dose of risk taking is necessary uh, for success. But by uh, taking a step back and reflecting on these questions, what you do is you bring to the surface some of the perhaps unconscious processes that might influence your decisions. And so then you'll be in a better position 
to evaluate whether taking a risk in this situation is really appropriate or not, or why you're doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Mehdi. And so now we will turn it over to Helen. Thanks, Mehdi, for helping us better understand why Vegas is so successful in luring all the money out of our pockets. I, I bet there's some research out there <clears throat> that says alcohol leads to people feeling more powerful and therefore more optimistic and less apt to consider all the possible outcomes and extremely interested in signaling the power that we have to everyone around us. One good roll of the dice and we're hooked. As Lauren said, what, what I'm going to do is try and link some of Medi's concepts to what I've experienced in the organizations I've been a part of, focusing on a few key ideas. And then hopefully, uh, as, as Lauren also said, we'll, uh, we'll fulfill the Haskian promise of going away fully fed physically and mentally after some lively conversation. So my, my talk is going to be divided into two parts this morning. The first is just to explore some various concepts of power, so things like um, the two kinds of power that show up in organizations, how decision making links uh, with power in a hierarchy, and then the concept of risk and risk mitigation. And then in the second part, I'll talk about a few situations which illustrate how power and decision making under different circumstances can be interesting in an organization. And to give you a bit of a sense of where I'm going, I'll tell you one of my theses, and that, that is that I think there are lots of situations where power and decision making can go awry. Um, but I tend to think that in a public company environment uh, these days, at least, there are so many interventions that uh, I think we actually mitigate a lot against a lot of wildcat or, or bold decisions. I should mention that I've only ever worked in, in large public companies, um, so some of my comments may not ring true for you if you've been part of a smaller organization or private companies um, that maybe have less infrastructure than, than what I'll be talking about. So we'll explore some of these differences when we get to the Q&A session, so please do jump in. So first of all, the concept of power. Um, Mehdi mentioned um, that his research m measured the difference between those who had felt more or less power. Um, but he also said that, that in the studies, people had been granted power in a, in a formal way. And of course, in an organization, that's, that's really not how it, it typically works. Um, typically, there are I, are, I think, two kinds of important powers. There's positional power, which is the power that's, um, that comes with the position you occupy in the organization. And um, you know, typically, you think of the CEO as having the most power. And, somebody at the bottom of the total, totem pole having the least. And, and power is defined in, in terms of things like what kind of um, decision making the person can, can do. So what kind of financial decisions, what kind of people decisions, what kind of business decisions does the infrastructure and the hierarchy around you permit you to have. The second kind of important power, I think, is personal power. So this is the power that is ascribed to people based on, on levels of expertise or their perceived ability to influence somebody else um, tends to be very relationship-based. So someone with a lot of personal power in an organization might be a, a key advisor to the CEO, for instance. And I don't know if you've got any uh, House of Cards fans in the organization, but I think of Kevin Spacey as, as somebody with a huge amount of personal power, even though he doesn't have a lot of positional power. Uh, he's also a good example of somebody who takes riskier decisions the more powerful he feels. I'd, and I, I stayed away from the spoiler on that one, Ken. I didn't tell anybody what happened in season two. Uh, do we have any House of Cards fans in the audience? If you're not, you should be. It's great. But you've got to book the weekend for it. <laughs> so understanding these kinds of powers um, helps you mitigate against decision making that's flawed by excessive power. And it helps you mitigate against failing to incorporate the, think the thinking of those people who actually have a lot of um, personal power or sort of uh, position, personal power. So another key concept to, to look at in terms of how decision making works in organizations is, um, is there's a sort of three different things to, to think about. Um, first of all, there are things like corporate culture. So um, is the corporate culture consensus-based? Is it autocratic? Uh, how long are people comfortable waiting for decisions to be made? And how many people are involved in big decisions? 
Does the executive team make a collective decision? Uh, does the CEO shrink the group down to a smaller size, or does the CEO, in fact, make decisions by himself? Another component is, are there things like a decision framework established in an organization? Most companies have some kind of decision framework around making big capital investment decisions. That's the easiest, clearest thing to point to. Um, you know, where you look at economic criteria, you look at some qualitative criteria, you probably do a full risk assessment. If that exists, that helps with understanding how the decision making happens in an organization. Some comp companies also have um, strategic decision making as a, as a core value. Um, something they train the whole organization in. The board that I'm on thinks of decision making as a value and actually trains every, but everybody from the shop floor up in terms of how they want people to make decisions uh, as they go about their daily work. And of course, we can't forget the board of directors in a public company and its linkages to shareholders. So, you know, in, in my view anyway, CEOs rarely, if ever, make decisions, big decisions on their own or without the board's participation. It's just the, the way things are structured. The regulatory processes that govern the issues of, of um, public equity and debt are there to protect the value of that equity and debt. And so there's a framework around how, how big decisions can get made. The Dodd-Frank Act in the US right now is busy establishing uh, a set of rules around uh, proper risk assessment following the financial crisis of, of recent years again, to make sure that proper governance is in place. Each public company has a set of uh, terms of reference for its board of directors, a financial authority framework, which determines who gets to, to spend money, um, policies and rules around hiring and firing, uh, and a broader framework around the nature of decisions the CEO and, and consequently the executive team get to make. I was at Petro Canada during the, the failed Ultramar Diamond Shamrock um, merger. This is probably going back 15 years, I think. And uh, things looked encouraging early on, and the, the president of the, the downstream business decided to move the employees of that business to Toronto before the deal had actually been consummated. And I wasn't in the tent at the time. I was a much more junior employee, but the rumor mill was buzzing because the belief was that the, the president of the downstream ha hadn't actually cleared that decision with the CEO before he made it. And with the merger ended, you know, ending up in, in failure, it was a pretty big decision to make without possibly being clear about who owned which decision. So on to part B, with that groundwork set, I'll just highlight a few situations where I think decision making can get interesting. In, in business these days, particularly in, in oil and gas, decisions tend to have a pretty long shelf life. If I think about airline companies, they're, they're out making decisions on what their demand is going to be. Uh, probably 10 years out, they're commissioning uh, planes to be built um, a long, long time in the future. In, in oil and gas, the cycle is, is similarly long. In Calgary alone today, we've got over $75 billion worth of, uh, of capital projects underway just between our two pipeline companies. And most of them won't generate cash flow for, for quite a while. So what happens after we've taken the plunge and we've made a decision to invest? Do we ever stop and reconsider? And do we ever look back and see whether or not the decisions we made were the right ones? And how does optimism bias come into play? One of the situations that, that plays out in real life in lots of companies these days are, are things like SAP implementations, where these are multi-million dollar decisions and you make a decision and it takes several, several years for you to implement. And you set a go live date, you've got a target out there, you've got a team working on it, and you just plow ahead. And you know, typically we make these decisions under one context and one environment. One of the most difficult things to do, but the most important things to do, is to make sure there's a step in the process to stop and decide whether or not going live is actually the right thing to do, and whether or not all the risks have been assessed, whether or not you're ready to implement put the tools down and make sure you've got the right group of people in the room to have this discussion. And if you put that step and that, that process in place and you make sure that people who have not only positional power but also personal f power have a view and have a, vo a, a voice in that decision, you end up with a, a better outcome in my mind. Another topic to explore is how power is distributed through an organization. 
and whether or not people at different levels in the organization are made to feel empowered to make decisions with, within their own sphere of influence. You often hear people talking about feeling powerless or conversely, leadership trying to empower people to achieve greater results. And I'm a firm believer in the benefit of empowering people within your organization to make decisions, but you have to lay the foundation sufficiently to make sure their decisions are aligned with the overall good of the organization. Empowering people sounds good, but, but what does it really mean? Some people think it means letting people run wild, getting out of the driver's seat and abdicating leadership and exposing yourself to everyone's judgment. But I actually don't think it has to be that way if you make sure that there, there are three components in place. The first of all is having a clear sense of where the organization's headed and what's important to the company and to leadership. Do people know what matters? Right down to the shop floor. If everybody knows how their role fits into the organization and contributes to the greater good, what the end game is, I think it can be really valuable to make sure that you've got everybody aligned and able to make decisions by themselves. Secondly, I think you have to have an established set of corporate values that are well communicated, they're enforced, they're visible, and people are held accountable for upholding them. Again, people can make decisions on the basis of those values. So if you think about, um, you know, in, a, in an oil and gas environment particularly, if, if everybody understands that safety is the top priority and that no matter what else happens, safety has to be in the forefront. Uh, a gas plant operator who's choosing between trying to operate his gas plant for maximum production versus taking care of a mechanical issue that might lead to a leak or, or an explosion at worst, then that gas plant operator can make the right decision within his own sphere of influence, knowing that the parameters that uh, are around him are, are appropriate, will be viewed appropriately by others. And lastly, if you have a consistent decision framework in the organization, um, that makes a big difference as well. If people understand that they should be stepping back, thinking about risk, thinking about time frame, thinking about economic parameters, trade-offs, and, and things like that, um, you're, you're likely to lead to better empowered decisions. And over the course of the, the last year at Talisman, we incorporated all three components of that into work we were doing to move decision making down into the organization and enable much more to happen at the grassroots level. We had a program called Count Me In and it was designed to, to provide some more visibility to the choices people were making to help the company work better, safer, faster and, and at lower cost. And um, the results were great. We had a lot of people feeling much more empowered, much more able to, to do what they thought was right for the company and much more able to actually make decisions. So while there are, I think there are lots and lots of situations where power and decision making can, can go awry and, and Mehdi mentioned a few of them, I tend to think that, that you know, the public company environment these days is actually um, constraining some of our, our thinking. Um, and one of the questions I think about is whether or not we're neutering innovation and creativity and bold moves by virtue of all of these constraints and in, in infrastructure. And, you know, I think you could argue that it's innovation and creativity of, of things like uh, the American banks and the mortgage-backed securities that led to a lot of these constraints being put in place. But I think we have to really watch not to over-tilt and over-compensate uh, uh, and make sure that we're incubating some small companies where bold and innovative thinking can happen and a bit more risk taking can happen. So with that, I'll turn you back to Lauren and uh, we get some conversation going. Well, thank you, Helen. So I've, I've been sitting here thinking about how I would summarize these two talks and one of the uh, thoughts I had was Quaker Oats. And my first thought was I wouldn't want um, to teach our MBAs their decision process. I uh, also wonder how much pain they felt after selling Snapple, and I think they should have brought Helen in as a consultant. <laughs> so um, so what we want to do now is turn it over to the Q&A, um, to the audience, to all of you. But first of all, I'm going to use my power and ask two questions. So my first question, prior to you having a chance, is asking Mehdi, um, is there any research that suggests there's gender differences in any of this risk or decision-making? That's a tricky question. Um, 
actually, we see throughout uh, the studies that there is a slight gender difference. Um, in general, overall, uh, men tend to make riskier decisions than women. But what is interesting is that when power is in play, there is no gender difference. So powerful women take as many risks as powerful men. So in fact, power is a much better predictor of risk taken than gender is. Uh, when they're both in the equation, it is power that counts, not gender. Okay, and Helen, I'm going to ask you with your seasoned experience. It's the third time she's called me seasoned. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get a complex. Distinguish, distinguish. Not much better. <laughs> I just old. Just call it old. <laughs> no, no, that's me. <laughs> Um, I um, was wondering if you could talk about some of the gender differences you might have seen in the workplace and how women or men, maybe early or late in their careers, handled power. Yeah, so that, so I'll, I'll tackle the first part of that question, maybe the, the gender bit first. Um, we were talking about this earlier, and, and I said to Mehdi, you know, I'm not sure that I could make a sweeping comment and say that I think women make decisions differently from men from a, a power perspective, but I, I think there's a decision-making process that might be slightly different between men and women in that I think women might, and uh, you know, no offense to any of the women or men in the room here, um, everybody is unique, but I think there's, there's probably more of a consensus collaborative, is everybody going to be okay with this decision kind of approach that women tend to employ more so than, than men. And I would argue, going back to your comment, Mehdi, the, the comment about risk, it would be interesting to look at uh, a decision and then the implementation of that decision because I think there's there's something again in that that question of collaboration and um, you know consensus that might mitigate the successful or help having a successful outcome from making a risky decision that that if you looked at the full cycle um, you might find that that women do more of figuring out whether or not there's going to be somebody around to implement that decision after it's been made. Okay. I think if I, if I add something to that, um, I, I really like that distinction between making the decision and implementing the decision. Because a lot of the things that we talked about, like optimism, for example, is great when you're implementing the decision. It's a good thing. Be optimistic when you're implementing the decision. It's a good thing. It may not be good when you're assessing risks, but when you're implementing the decision, it is a good thing. So it's a very good distinction um, between making the decision and implementing it. Okay. Thank you. So what I'd like to do is ask if there are any questions from the floor. There are two mics, one on each side there. So if you have a question, if you could go to the mic to um, ask your question. Okay, well, people are still thinking, I still have another question for Helen. Um, given your experience, I'm wondering, there's lots of young professionals in the room today. And I'm wondering if you have any advice for them on what might happen as they're moving through their career in terms of thinking about power and risk. Yeah, I mean, I think um, when people are on a, a steep upward trajectory um, and they look around and think about how, how they're going to have an impact, um, you know, sometimes making a big, bold decision is, is what comes to mind. Um, one of the things I, I would suggest is making sure that you understand whether or not you have the right to make a big, bold decision. Um, as I said, there's, there's a lot of uh, hierarchy these days that helps people understand how much money they can spend, what kind of people decisions they can make, and really understanding what, you know, what your sphere of influence is, is important. Some organizations, that's clearer than others, um, but you'll definitely know if you're on the wrong side of it, um, which is not a happy place to be. Um, and then the second point, I think, is just sort of recognizing that there is a tendency to be bolder and to, to try to take um, more risk at certain points in your career. So stepping back and saying, you know, have I really thought about this? Have I covered my bases off? Um, how am I going to feel if, those, if this goes right? How am I going to feel if it goes wrong? And I, have I taken the advice of the people around me who may have lots more experience and seasoning than, than I do? Uh, those are the couple things I think about. Okay, I'm going to bring it to closure because we're very close to our promise, all right, and I want to stay with it. But I have a couple of uh, comments. First of all, we're planning the 2014-15 season or series, and um, if you have any topics that you think we could cover or should think about, please write it on the comment card. 
Also, if you have any other comments on how we can refine this series, we would love to hear. There is also a card on your table that has the QR code. That QR code, if you use your phone and, and tag on to it, um, gives you the PowerPoint slides from this morning and also the PowerPoint and also the PowerPoint slides from Omni Channel Retailing. So Don, your slides will also be there. And so if you want to see, if you weren't here for the last talk and you want to know more about Omni Channel Retailing, that QR code will lead you. And um, Jamie, I thank you. I am good at reading signals. <laughs> okay. So what we have is a small gift for our speakers. Helen, we'd like to thank you very much for taking time out thank and coming and speaking with us. And Mehdi for taking time out as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.